Israel Today each week on this station. Here's our host and Bible teacher, Chris Katolka. Hey everybody, the Friends of Israel Today is a unique radio show that teaches biblical truth for changing times. We do this through Q&A, timely interviews, dramatic readings from the life of Holocaust survivor Zvi Kalisher, and of course, Bible teaching. To learn more, visit foiradio.org. Join us for Friends of Israel Today, Sunday morning at 1130 Central on American Family Radio. Well, last week, the New York Democratic Socialists of America issued a statement of their beliefs. Abolish profit, abolish prisons, abolish cash bail, abolish borders. We don't have ideological diversity within the two major parties. I hear Democrats saying, we want to abandon ICE. We want to abandon, we're not abandoning ICE. We're not abandoning our law enforcement. Just the opposite. Sarah Huckabee has no right to live a life of no fuss, no muss. 78, 78% of Americans do not own a gun. Right, and they're all the liberals. This is a crucial election. 2020 is not the year where the Democrats can run a woman and win. 2020 is not the year where Democrats can run a black person and win. They're going to have to run a white guy. Freedom prospers when religion is vibrant and the rule of law under God is acknowledged. An informed patriot is what we want. Welcome to American Family Radio's Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. Muscular Christianity. Where we relentlessly explore the intersection of truth and politics. The trouble with our liberal friends is not that they're ignorant. It's just that they know so much that isn't so. Now, here's your host, Brian Fisher. Howdy and welcome to a day after the 4th of July broadcast of Focal Point on American Family Radio. Brian Fisher is my name, congenial, convivial, amiable, and effervescent as always. The program is Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity. And you're listening to American Family Radio Network. Welcome aboard the USS Focal Point. It is our warship. This is not a pleasure cruise. We are going to war today on behalf of our country, trying to reclaim and recapture what has been lost. Reclaim the original vision of the founders for the United States of America. They laid it out for us in the Declaration of Independence, which we celebrated uh, yesterday, and they codified it in the Constitution, which we're going to talk about today as we talk about possible Supreme Court nominees. Now, before we jump into all of that, we want to go to the book that guided the founders, Remember, 34% of all of the external citations that were found in the speeches and the writings of the founding fathers, 34% of them came directly from the Bible. The next highest source, 8%. So 34%, every time they cited an external source to verify, to confirm, to amplify, to illustrate the political point they were trying to make, the Bible was their source. As President Andrew Jackson said, this book is the rock on which the Republic rests. Well, let's take a look at the book on which the Republic rests. We are in Isaiah 28 in our reading. And the first thing we run into here, we got a couple of different topics that Isaiah addresses here. The first thing he addresses, addresses is substance abuse. And he says, don't do it. Just flat out don't do it because it makes you stupid. He says, that's the reason not to do it. It makes you stupid. You vomit all over yourself, and you fall down. So Isaiah says, God, through Isaiah, says, do not do it. Uh, He rebukes the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and the fading glory of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome with wine. So those that get into substance abuse, whether it's booze, whether it's coke, whether it's methamphetamines, Uh, Whether it's weed, whatever it happens to be, they get attached to that, get addicted to it, and they can squander an entire fortune. That's what happened to the people of uh, Ephraim. And he says, this is the Lord bringing judgment on people that ignore his clear instructions in the word of God. You know, the New Testament says, do not be drunk with wine or any other uh, intoxicating substance, mind-altering substance, but instead be filled with with the Spirit of the Lord. The things that people look for in substances, we are to find in the Spirit of the Lord. If you're looking for some kind of relief from the pressures of life, the place to find it is in the Spirit of the Lord, not in booze or in weed. If you're looking for some kind of release 
from pressure and anxiety. Don't find it in weed or booze or meth. Find it in the spirit of the Lord. In other words, the basic instruction of, uh, of the Bible is do not let anything, do not let anything other than the spirit of God have control of your life. Don't give yourself and your mind over to any intoxicating substances because as uh, we see here in verse 7, these also reel with wine and they stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are swallowed by wine. They stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. So it impairs judgment, which is why you have a lot of people dying in, in, in car crashes where people are over the level of intoxication that's permitted by law, amount of consumption. So anyway, that's one of the warnings that Isaiah has in here. And there's a second thing I want to focus on when he talks about how the Word of God is to be taught, how the Word of God is to be presented to God's people. He says this in verse 9, asking a, a question. If you've got all these people, the priests and the prophet, they're drunk, they're, they're zonked out on weed, or they're coked up, where are we going to go to find knowledge? Uh, to whom will he teach knowledge? So you, we need to find somebody who will come and give people the word of the Lord if the people that we normally count on are not available because they've given their minds and their bodies over to intoxicating beverages or to substance abuse. To whom will he teach knowledge and to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast, so people that are mature and have their faculties about them. And he says this twice in this chapter, for it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. He says down again in verse 13, the word of the Lord will be to them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So I think what the writer is talking about here is the way the Word of God is to be taught is precept by precept and line by line. Don't always do this, but what we're talking here about is expository preaching, where you take the Word of God, and this is, what, this is the kind of preaching I always did when I pastored, pick a passage of Scripture and work through that passage, that section of Scripture. We do a whole book this way, take as, however long it took to get through an entire book of the, uh, of the Bible. We would go line upon line and precept upon precept. wasn't always necessary to do it that way, but you wanted to make sure that people understood the Word of God in its original context. So that's how I would teach. Sometimes you would go not just line by line, but go word by word to unfold, to unpack, to explain the meaning of the Word of God. Sometimes you need to dig into a particular word, break it down by its etymology, even talk about what it means in some of the related languages so the people you're teaching have a full sense of what the Word of God means. And you can't ever get to the bottom of the depth of the Word of God, even if you go word by word, phrase by phrase, which is, which is the way I like to preach. You know, uh, I think it was um, an early church father by, uh, who was the guy's name? I just blanked out on the guy's name. Uh, Jerome, uh, responsible for the Vulgate, the Latin translation of the Bible. Jerome said that the Bible is like a river in which, in which children may wade, but elephants must swim. So there's truth here that's accessible, it's available to the youngest among us, but there is truth here that is only available to those who are willing to dig deep into the Word. Well, let's uh, go to prayer with some of the concepts that we've looked at and talked about in this passage of Scripture. Lord God, we worship you this day as the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts. You are wonderful in counsel and magnificent and excellent in wisdom. We pray for our legislators and our judges today that you will be a spirit of justice to those who sit in judgment. May your justice be our nation's measuring line and your righteousness our plumb line. 
I pray for our military that you will be a source of strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. I bring myself and my family, this listening audience, everyone within the sound of my voice today, I ask that you will be a glorious crown and a beautiful wreath to us. Be for us the one who is mighty and strong. When we are weary, I ask you to be a resting place for us and a place of repose. I ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When I first found out I was pregnant, I was surrounded by fear and disbelief. My boyfriend told me at the time to, to get an abortion. There was no negotiating. This is the story of a young lady who decided to keep her baby after hearing her baby's beautiful heartbeat on ultrasound. The Ministry of Preborn provides ultrasounds for pregnancy centers across America for free. When an abortion-minded woman hears her baby's heartbeat on ultrasound, she's 80% more likely to keep her baby. My son Rent turned five months this week, and, and even though there, there are still uncertainties in my life, the one thing I know is I get to watch him grow. Your gift of $140 will cover the cost of five ultrasounds. All donations are tax deductible. To donate, go to preborn.com. That's preborn.com. Or dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250 and say baby. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. My name is Abraham Hamilton III, and this is the Hamilton Minute. Connecticut's high school state open track and field championships for girls saw new records set in both the 100 and 200 meter runs. The record setting winner was Terry Miller, a biological boy who identifies as transgender. The same Miller competed on his school's boys team during the winter indoor track season. The runner up in the 100 meter race was Andrea Yearwood, also a boy who dominated this girls' event last year. The trans agenda, destroying our culture and women's sports. Where are the feminists? Listen each weekday from 5 to 6 p.m. Central for the Hamilton Corner or visit the podcast page at AFR.net for more from Abraham Hamilton III, public policy analyst for the American Family Association. This is Focal Point with Brian Fisher on American Family Radio. Howdy, welcome back to Focal Point on American Family Radio, the home of Ultra 4K radio. Radio in high definition, more content, ultra high definition, more content per cubic inch of air than any other place on your radio dial. <laughs> now, what I want to do start off with is uh, I, I, we'll kind of talk a little bit just in general about politics, and then we're going to get into some specifics. Jeff trying to make sure his microphone is working over there. Yeah, you don't he thinks miss he's that. he thinks he's a real he thinks he's a real funny guy. <laughs> I and know. We don't think he's yeah. as funny as he thinks he is. Uh, and he I, thinks somebody turned off his mic. So uh, I, it it was an accident. I. I think. <laughs> as, as, board op, as a board op over here, I'm sitting here looking, and okay. I checked it before. It worked. It didn't then. I have to blame it on the I've user. been censored like Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I got a thing in here about censorship on Facebook now that you bring it up. I will start with that little story. Facebook and Apple are disagreeing right now about how to shut us as conservatives down. Oh. They've been doing this. Lloyd Marcus had a patriotic song, and Facebook would not accept an advertisement for it. Lloyd Marcus is, is a black conservative, uh, and he thinks that it probably got blacklisted. They couldn't even buy an ad for it because he was black. He's a black in there, and he's a picture of Donald Trump as a part of the song, the imagery in the, in the video. So Facebook just flatly turned down advertising for that. There was another group that produced a patriotic song. They put it up on their Facebook page, and Facebook just shut it down. It was, it was just a plain old patriotic song. Facebook said we're shutting it down because of political uh, content. Now, here's that article about how they're disagreeing on how to curb fake news. Now, what Apple is doing is they are going to a combination of human editors and machine learning to try to tailor the content and identify good news, true news, from fake news. Listen to this. 
they're going to use sources that they describe as trustworthy. This is what Apple's going to do. We're only going to use trustworthy sources. You know who their top three sources are? Oh, no. The Washington Post, oh, no. Politico, yeah. and Axios, which is a website for the millennial generation. All three of them hopelessly tilted to the left. But those, according to the people at Apple, are trustworthy sources. There was an interesting thing, though, here that happened with, um, let's see, with Apple is they included Fox News and then they let their readers weigh in on who the best sources were. The, the sources that the users of Apple actually favored. There were 7,000 news recommendations made by Apple News and users of Apple News. Editors had a strong tendency to favor a select group of media uh, legacy media outlets like the New York Times. But with Facebook, the company abandoned its automated trending feature and restructured, restructured the newsfeed algorithm to rank news sources on a trustworthiness scale determined by users. It's Facebook here I'm talking about, not Apple. Apple didn't use feedback from users. They had their editors and their trustworthy sources, the New York Times, Washington Post, all that stuff. But Facebook decided they would get feedback from users. It wasn't Apple, it was Facebook, my, my mistake, that took feedback from users. Fox News has benefited from Facebook's algorithmic changes to highlight trustworthy sources. This past April, the outlet generated the most engagement on Facebook, outpacing sources such as CNN, NBC, and the New York Times. So when users had a chance to weigh in, and tell Facebook which sources they trusted the most. Uh, Fox News is the one that came in on top of the heap. So, an interesting story from uh, Russia. Blood rain fell in Russia. It freaked the people out uh, in a remote region of Russia because blood was raining from the skies. And a remote region of Russia has turned a blood-stained red into a shocking weather event. Extraordinary footage of the scene shows the red rain pouring down in the Siberian city of Norilsk. Vehicles and ground were soaked in a blood red rain. According to Russia Today, locals in Norilsk feared that the rain signaled an imminent apocalypse of a biblical plague. It was like a horror movie. There was bloody rain. But it turned out there is a perfectly innocent explanation for this. There is a company called Nornickel. It's a metal company. And they were cleaning up a plant, my, uh, cleaning up a mining operation. And there were huge quantities of iron oxide that had been removed from the factory floor and the roof in order to improve the environment. It was <laughs> gathered in piles and prepared to be taken away. A gust of wind blew it over the parking lot while the rain caused it to fall. So they thought <laughs> yeah. they were back in the days of Moses and yeah, the that's plagues. Yeah, a little creepy. Yeah. But, you know, it gives you an so idea of maybe how God pulled off some of those miracles. Uh, you know, it gets, he may have used natural events mm -hmm. that he caused, and then it produced uh -huh. the optics of these, uh, but it was mm -hmm. him doing it yeah. by a miraculous deal. Anyway. It's funny that they did that in order to improve the environment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sending work out. metal oxide all right. over Russia in yeah. order to clean the environment. Now, here's a story that animal lovers will take a certain amount of pleasure in, although it involves the death of three people. I don't know if you saw this. There was a gang of poachers that broke into this South African game reserve, and they were there to slaughter a herd of rhinos. They mm -hmm. wanted the horns. Rhino horns are worth yeah. a whole ton of money. And so poachers will go in there just to hunt uh, rhinos. These guys got in there, did not realize that there was a pack of six hungry lions in there. And the six hungry lions ate up the three poachers. All they found left of them were their shoes. Wow. That's why they think there were just three, because they only found three pairs of shoes. Could be more. They're trying to put human body parts together to figure out how many were dead. But they really don't know. Just found three pairs of shoes with no feet uh, in them. 
Uh, they've had nine uh, rhinos that have been killed by poachers on the Eastern Cape Reserves this year, and the reserve lost three rhinos in 2016. So a lesson there for anybody looking to poach uh, rhinos. That's so sad, too. There's a superstition about the 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 horn yeah. that they will sell that ground up and use it as uh, medicines and all kinds of yeah, stuff. And other nations. and yeah, stuff. It's and, crazy. Yeah. Now, uh, this uh, I, I'm not vouching for Snoop Dogg at all. Thank you. I want you to be clear <laughs> as I go into the story. Not vouching for him. Uh, this is the story I just find kind of interesting. Story on The Blaze where Snoop Dogg, the rapper... At the BET, that's the Black Entertainment Television Network, at the BET Awards on Sunday, he ended his performance by putting on a choir robe, turning the entire background into a chapel with stained glass windows, and then sang one of his latest songs, which is about Christianity and baptism. So he finished this BET performance, uh, by turning the stage into a stained glass church and seg segueing into a new track called Sunrise. H here are some of the lyrics. I guess you could say I'm a brand new man. See, rap guys usually don't get baptized, but how could you cleanse your sins without it? Make you want to think about it. The right reverend, the reverend right, recite light. You see today is the day to get your life right. Here's another part of the song. Voices from vices got me standing, got me standing me here, singing praises to your name for saving me from my yesterday. Second chances come with every sunrise. So that's uh, Snoop Dogg singing a song about baptism, washing his sins away in the name of Jesus, your name, capital Y, but let's not forget that Snoop Dogg converted to Islam in 2009, uh, didn't stick, became Rastafarian in 2012, changed his name to Snoop Lion. Nobody bought it, so it went back to being Snoop Dogg. But in 2017, and then in 2017, he did that video where he's fake shooting a likeness of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. 2017. Now he's singing songs about baptism and how every sunrise is a second chance. Now, that part is true. You know why I think God gives us 24-hour days? I mean this. God gives us 24-hour days so that every day we get a fresh start. Mm -hmm. Every day we've got a chance not to do what we did the day before. You know what I mean? And I'm so glad that mm -hmm. you, can put a, you, know, you can put a pin in, in Tuesday, close the book, mm -hmm. and then open the book on Wednesday and have a fresh chance to start with a clean slate through repentance and prayer, and then learn from what the mistakes you made yesterday and plow ahead with a new start. So every sunrise is a second chance. That's according to theologian, uh, theologian Snoop Dogg, but on that one, he actually was right. Got another story here about a Roe v. Wade film that's shooting in New Orleans right now as we speak, but they're running into trouble. They've had to film this thing under a fake name because when people find out what the movie is about, uh, they drop out of the cast, they drop out of being mm. location managers, they get kicked off of campuses and stuff like that. Now, Nick Loeb is the guy that is filming this thing. He's directing it. It's the true story of Roe v. Wade, the true story of Norma McCorvey. She's the one who, who these lawyers went to battle for. She didn't even know what they were doing. She didn't even want an abortion. She didn't get an abortion. That's the amazing thing about Roe v. Wade. It was all about granting a woman a right to abortion. She never got one, didn't want one. Uh, but anyway, she was just used as a tool by these Planned Parenthood-type uh, lawyers, and now they're shooting the true story uh, about that. Nick Loeb is, uh, is directing it. The cast includes John Voigt, uh, Robert Davy. He was one of the FBI guys in Lethal Weapon. One of the two FBI guys okay. crashed their helicopter into the, and the guy says, looks like we're going to need some more FBI guys. <laughs> well, he was one of the guys who went down on the helicopter and lethal weapon. And then an actress named Stacy Dash, who was from a movie called Clueless, which I have not seen yeah. uh, and I do not plan to see. I thought Look, she got involved in politics at yeah. some point, too. Yeah, she was a, a contributor on Fox News for a while, okay. and then she actually ran for Congress 
But man, she found out that running for public office as a Republican, especially as a black Republican, was just... She's black, isn't she, Stacey yeah, Dash? I believe so. Was, she just, was just brutal. So she dropped out because of too much of a toll on her uh, family. Uh, but they've been filming this in places like New Orleans. When Louisiana State found out about it, they uh, uh, blocked them from filming on campus. The same thing happened at Tulane, a synagogue in New, Lor New Orleans that they'd rented for catering as a place for extras to hang out. Once the synagogue found out, they got bounced. But it'll be coming out in January. Focal Point, American Family Radio. Be right back. This is Dr. Richard Lamb, President of Southern Evangelical Seminary. Welcome to Bringing Every Thought Captive. In the wake of the 4th of July celebrations, it is encouraging to note that polls show that a significant majority of Americans still believe America is a special and exceptional nation. A public religion research institute poll revealed that 62% of American adults believe that God has granted America a special role in human history, a concept most often called American exceptionalism. Even one-third of American atheists, agnostics, and those with, quote, no religious preference, quote, believe America has a special relationship with God. While Americans are not God's chosen nation, America nevertheless is exceptional and blessed by God in unique ways. American exceptionalism is the understanding that America is a unique nation with a unique sense of purpose that started with the nation's settlement and has since morphed through various meanings, all of them centered on the observation that America is distinct from other countries in the world, in its founding, in its government, in its social and economic structures, and in its religious and cultural character. America has been blessed in manifold ways. When you look at our resources, our protection by two oceans, our standard of living, can you argue that America has not been uniquely and providentially blessed? These blessings are not just material. It's remarkable that one generation that produced our founding fathers emerged and put together the Constitution that has served us so well for more than two centuries and has brought unparalleled freedom to an unparalleled number of people, unequaled by any other country in the world. American exceptionalism is not a delusion of national grandiosity, nor is it a source of pride and privilege. It is a doctrine of sacrifice and responsibility and an obligation to help others achieve freedom. To whom much is given, much is required and God's blessings are always undeserved. America has received them, and we must pass them on. For more information about Southern Evangelical Seminary, go to ses.edu. This is Richard Land. This is Focal Point with Brian Fisher on American Family Radio. Listen to the audio podcast or download today's program at AFR.net. You can also read Brian Fisher's columns at AFA.net. AFA.net. Howdy and welcome back to Focal Point on American Family Radio. Brian Fisher is my name. Program is uh, Focal Point. Uh, let me just uh, run through some news, get everybody kind of caught up to speed. This is kind of the first part of this segment will be kind of the lightning round. Let me start with this. This is uh, I intended to get to this in the last segment, but didn't. Uh, Scarlett Johansson. I don't know if you're familiar with her as an actress. Uh, if you follow movies, you probably know who she is. Anyway, she's facing a casting backlash from the LGBT community because she, she has accepted a role to play a transgender man. That is a man who believes he's a woman trapped in a man's body, and she's accepted that role. And now transgender people are, are, are just climbing her frame. This is horrible. This is inexcusable. You shouldn't have done this. She's going to play the role of a transgender massage parlor owner by the name of Dante Tex Gill. And transgenders are all up in arms. This is a role that ought to be played by a transgender. You know, if I was Scarlett Johansson, you know all I would say? is I would say to all these people, look, that's why they call it acting. Yeah. That's why they call it acting. So anyway, I, mean, I have no interest in seeing this film. But, uh, yeah. All right, uh, let's run through some news here in the lightning round. Uh, there is a rare copy of the United States Declaration of Independence that was found in an archive in the UK. It's a very rare parchment copy of the Declaration found at a British archive among the papers of an aristocrat who supported the rebels at the time of the revolution. It's been authenticated. It was produced in the 1780s. 
discovered last year at the West Sussex Record Office in the southern English city of Chichester uh, by a team of researchers led by two Harvard University academics. The only other contemporary manuscript copy of the Declaration of Independence on parchment, apart from the signed copy at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. So, the good news is that the British have discovered the Declaration of Independence. Now, if only the Democrats <laughs> would find this thing, yeah. particularly the part that talks about our rights coming to us from the Creator, yeah. with a capital C, and not from the state, and that one of the inalienable rights that has been given to us by the Creator is the right to life. 47% uh, of Americans are extremely proud to be American. 72% are uh, extremely or very proud of being an American. This is a 4th of July type poll. Uh, but the 4th of July mark represents a new low in overall U.S. patriotism because only 47% describe themselves as extremely proud. This is down from 51% just a year ago and well below the peak of 70% in 2003. That was in the wake of 9-11 and our vigorous response to 9-11 under President Bush. Uh, but 72%, 74% of Republicans are extremely proud to be Americans, contrasted to 32% of Democrats who are extremely proud to be Americans. So that's the breakdown. 74% of Republicans extremely proud of this country, just 32% of Democrats. You know, here's a story about migration of Americans, and uh, it lists the 50 worst cities in America to live in, but the, the, the part of this story that I found interesting is in USA Today was the identification of the cities who have lost the most population through migration. In other words, they have people that have moved completely out of that city. They've had it. That city is too much this. It's too much that. We're out of here. We're history. We are gone. We're going to find a new and better uh, place uh, to live. So there's 50 cities they measured with the biggest population decline from migration. This is people living. Uh, the seventh worst was Milwaukee. 27,959 people have moved out of Milwaukee in the last seven years. Memphis, 30,000 people have moved out. Cleveland, 33,000. St. Louis, 40,000. Detroit, 55,000, and L.A., 94,000 people have moved out of town in the Chicago area. 296,000, 296,000 have moved out of Chicago. You know what all of these cities share in common? Mm. <laughs> They've been governed by Democrats for decades. Mm -hmm. That's what they all share in common. You look for one point of commonality, that's it. Been governed by, uh, by Democrats for decades decades. New York City is trying a new thing. They're going to roll out buses of peacekeepers. They're, they're, these are like trauma units. They're mobile trauma units. They're 60 feet long. They're spending $1.8 million this year to roll these things out. They're 60 foot, I don't know, vehicles that are packed with counselors and peacekeepers. They're going to run them to crime scenes, uh, crime scenes throughout the city to try to follow up on gun Violence. The buses will be deployed in January of 2019 to each borough to provide trauma relief. Some team members have prior criminal records and former gang affiliations. Anybody see any potential mm. problems with mm. that? I mean, just when you think New York just can't get any dumber, uh, here they're populating <laughs> their mobile trauma units with, with gang members and former criminal well criminals who knows that they're former uh, program is going to cost nine hundred thousand bucks a year uh, and it'll stay at crime scenes up to a week after crimes are committed deploys these large vehicles to vocations that have recurring crime throughout the city you know and you think rudy giuliani he got crime under control through stop and frisk they didn't need any 60-foot mobile trauma units in rudy giuliani's day he just sent cops to the most crime-ridden parts of the city. What they did is he had the police get a big giant map of the city, 
Okay, guys, just look at the stats. Just look at the stats. Don't look at anything else. Where are the crimes taking place? Where are the assaults? Where are the batteries? Where are the thefts? Where are the burglaries? Where are the armed robberies? Where are the rapes? Where are they taking place? And let's put stick pins where all of the uh, most violence is occurring in our city. And so what he did then, just, just darts on a board, not darts on a board, but pins on a board, based on the statistics of violence, then he's going to say, what we're going to do is we are going to increase the police presence in those areas, and we're going to implement a stop-and-frisk policy that if the police see anybody who's acting in a way that is suspicious, they can stop them and frisk them for weapons. Stop and frisk. It was used aggressively, and crime just plummeted in New York City. You know what the accusation against Rudy Giuliani was? That he was a racist. Because the communities where the most crime was taking place were minority communities. And so they accused Rudy Giuliani of being a racist. But the opposite is true. What was he trying to do? He was trying to protect people in minority neighborhoods from crime. How does that make him a racist when he's trying to protect them and provide an increasing level of security in those communities? Now, uh, also another city with a problem clear across the uh, continent is San Francisco. They've got a website and a related app that allows local residents to request maintenance or non-emergency services from the city. In the last week, they received 16,015 complaints of human waste in public places. This is on sidewalks. 16,000 complaints. Uh, you can take pictures and send the picture in with your complaint to this uh, website. Now, and they've uh, other complaints about needles and syringes all over the city. Um, California is now home to more than a quarter of the nation's homeless population. And San Francisco, this is hurting San Francisco. I've read articles about this, a number of articles, where conventions are refusing to go to San Francisco because it's just not safe. The conventioners can't go walk out of their hotel and feel safe in those neighborhoods. And so they're just not going there anymore. So San Francisco's got a huge problem uh, on their hands. You might be aware of the victory by an outright socialist. Uh, let's see, what was her first name? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez won a primary in New York, uh, defeated the fourth-ranking Democrat. The guy was in line maybe to be the next uh, majority leader for the, or the minority leader for the Democrats. Uh, and she is an out-and-out, out, she's an out-and-out out socialist. I mean, she buys their entire agenda. Let me get to their agenda here. Their agenda... That's somewhere in here. They want to abolish just about everything that keeps us safe. Jails. Uh, yeah, abolish borders, abolish prisons. Here it is. Abolish profit. Abolish prisons. Abolish cash bail. And abolish borders. That's the, the platform of the New York Democratic Socialist of America. She was a part of that party, ran as a representative of that party. Now, here is the problem for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a majority of likely American voters, not just a poll of Americans, but a poll of American voters, prefer a free market over socialism. 74% of Americans support a free market, which would be a wonderful thing if we had it, if we could get government out of the way. Only 13% of the people questioned say they would prefer Socialism, a socialist economic system, 74 to 13. So, yeah, maybe maybe those views will work in some borough in New York, but you try to trot that outside New York City, forget about it. You know, and this is the direction that the Democrats are heading. I mean, they're increasingly lurching toward an out-and-out out socialist program. Here's another nightmare for the Democratic Party that... The party is underperforming among Hispanics. You know, all this race baiting they've been doing, all of the fear mongering they've been doing, it is not paying off. This is Josh Crashour writing in the National Journal, which is a left leaning journal. 
Even during the heat of the family separation crisis, Democrats are underperforming in heavily Hispanic constituencies. From GOP-held border battlegrounds in Texas to diversifying districts in Southern California to the nation's most populous Senate battleground in Florida. You know what this tells you is Democrats believe racist stereotypes about minorities. They believe that blacks are incapable of advancing themselves without help from them, from Democrats. And they believe that Hispanics are all supportive of illegal immigration. They believe stereotypes that are not true, underperforming among Hispanics. Be right back with more. Women and men alike find themselves in despair after an abortion. Every woman who had an abortion was for a short time a mother, every man a father. But afterwards, they're all people in pain, anger, sadness, relationship problems. These often accompany an abortion. But there is hope. Call 866-482-LIFE. Your call is confidential, and you'll be talking with someone who has already been where you are and found the way out. 866-482-LIFE. In a democratic republic such as America, the hard work of democracy is done by the people. At the Values Voter Summit in Washington, D.C., September 21st through the 23rd, you'll be equipped to take up the battle for human life, strong religious liberty, and thriving families by strong conservative leaders. The Values Voter Summit is sponsored in part by AFA Action. Visit valuesvotersummit.org to register and obtain more information about the summit. That's valuesvotersummit.org. Hi, this is Steve Tiber with 8 Days of Hope. We've seen God open up so many doors for us to help serve and love those who get affected by a natural disaster. As the trees and the wind started crashing down around us, my wife was, of course, very diligently praying, you know, Lord, please be with us. Very simply, we do it because God commands us to love others. I see these volunteers all as a gift from God. And I'm just grateful they're here, you know, helping out. It's a blessing. If you're interested in becoming a part of what God's doing through 8 Days of Hope, please go to 8daysofhope.com, click on Get Involved, submit your email address. I've noticed that whenever there's a time in my life when um, things might be a little gloomy, the number one thing that I can do is to go serve somebody. And uh, I would encourage anyone else to, uh, it's worth it, come out and do it next time if you didn't make it to this one. And, um, the Father will really bless you in it. Thank you so much for your prayers and volunteering with 8 Days of Hope. American Family Radio. You're listening to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Brian Fisher. Howdy. Welcome back to Focal Point, American Family Radio. Brian Fisher is my name. And the program is Focal Point, home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. Just a programming note, at the top of the hour at 2.05 Central, we're going to have Patrick Kolbeck, State Senator Patrick Kolbeck from the state of Michigan. He's a candidate to become governor in the state of Michigan. This guy is an honest-to-goodness rocket scientist, worked on developing the space shuttle. Uh, so he is a top-notch astronautics, astrophysics engineer, and he's uh, served two terms in the Michigan Senate, is now running for governor. He's going to be our guest at the top of the hour at 2.05. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. I'm waiting to see if you accidentally call him a rocket surgeon. Well, I'm going to ask him about <laughs> performing rocket surgery or something like that. Uh, anyway, um, even among millennials, we saw that Democrats are underperforming uh, among uh Hispanics, that Hispanic support for Democrats is dropping. Remember, Donald Trump's support among Hispanics shot up 10% when everybody was talking about the border uh, crisis. So the millennial support for Democrats over Republicans has dropped by about 9 percentage points over the past two years. So the more Americans, even young Americans, find out what the Democrats stand for, the less they like what they are uh, reading. Now, Crash Hour makes this point in his article. This is from the National Journal, one I was just talking about, which means that the Democrats are believing all kinds of, of racial stereotypes. They believe that blacks can't advance themselves without Democratic help. What an obnoxious, mm -hmm. elitist, condescending stereotype mm -hmm. that is, that blacks are helpless 
without democratic uh, aid. I can't imagine anything that's more condescending than that. And they believe that Hispanics support lawbreaking when it comes to immigration. Again, that's an insulting stereotype. Turns out that they don't. Uh, that they want a secure border just like you and I do. They've got families. They've got jobs. They live in neighborhoods. They want them protected from MS-13. They want them protected from illegal aliens who compete for the same jobs. They want the same things that we do. They're just American families trying to stake their claim to the American dream in their part of the world. So Crash Hour is thinking that the uh, if immigration is going to affect the battle for Congress at all, it's going to be because of what he calls anti-Trump backlash among suburban women. Who are these? Those are the soccer moms. Uh, and he's he says that the Democrats have to bank on a backlash on the immigration issue among soccer moms, but Trump won a majority of the vote among married women. So that means Democrats, you know, their, their um, demographic slice that they're appealing to is now down, just about down to single women and childless and single mothers. I mean, that's, that's about it. That's who they're aiming for. That's who they're shooting for. You know, Rob and I were talking on the break about how they, the Democrats are running off everybody who believes in the First Amendment with all of their hateful rhetoric and all their censorship. Mm -hmm. They're running off people who, Democrats who believe in the Second Amendment because they mm -hmm. want to confiscate everybody's guns. They're just eventually just going to run out of people that are even willing to, to vote uh, for them. You know, and, and Tucker Carlson made the same point. I think I've got a sound bite uh, okay. to this effect. Yeah. Carlson making a point that, you know, the effort that the Democrats are making to make voters hate Donald Trump, staking their, their effort on getting voters to hate Donald Trump is just not working. In other words, the, the, the spread between Trump's approval and disapproval is narrowing, not growing. Now, here is clip number two. This is uh, Tucker Carlson talking about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, whose star is in the ascendancy. She's the out-and-out -out socialist, wants to abolish profits, wants to abolish prisons, wants to abolish borders. Here's Tucker Carlson talking about her. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is definitely with them. She's the soon-to-be congresswoman from New York's 14th district. She's a self-identified Democratic Socialist. What does that mean exactly? Well, last week, the New York Democratic Socialists of America issued a statement of their beliefs. Quote, abolish profit, abolish prisons, abolish cash bail, abolish borders. Abolishing prisons in a country with thousands of murders every year? What would that look like? Well, you probably wouldn't stick around to find out. You'd be long gone along with every other normal, productive person in what was once America, refugees from your own country. Something like that happened in Venezuela. There are people in our country working to make it happen here. And suddenly, some of them are prominent in the Democratic Party. Okay, so we'll see. Uh, Democrats going to stick to that. I think that is a losing ticket. I agree with Tucker Carlson about that. That sounds uh, pretty close to anarchy. Mm-hmm. And well, I, I don't understand the one thing. She wants to get rid of uh, prisons, but also cash bail. Yeah. How do those? How do those? Yeah, if you if you abolish prisons, what do you need? What do you yeah, even yeah. need bail for? Yeah. Now I've got I've got a clip about this. Some guy uh, I think it was um, who made exactly the same point. Oh, is is Louis Gomert? Let's go down to Louis right. Gomert, uh, which is clip number three. Yeah, here is uh, Louis Gomert talking to Charles Payne on Fox News. And he's talking about this effort to basically abolish the borders, just exactly what Jeff was saying. It shows you what a brilliant team I have assembled here at uh, Focal Point. My producer right on top of it, uh, anticipating, setting up this soundbite from Louis Gomert. Let's listen. It's a call for anarchy, and it's a, oh. amazing <laughs> that it has caught on and it has been spreading even among um, what were thought to be mainstream Democrats. I mean, it's insane. You don't have borders. You don't have a country. And when you're a welfare state like the U.S. has become, it is just a giant sucking sound from all over the world. You can't control it, and it means anarchy. It means uh, might makes right, and then that ultimately leads to a totalitarian dictator coming in and uh, rounding up the military, taking over. It, it's the way countries end, 
and a new dictatorship begins. You call for anarchy, and then you get a dictator. You know, and, and Louis Gohmert is exactly right about this. If you abolish borders, then anybody can sweep across your borders, and people that are sweeping across the borders are going to be jihadists. They're going to be MS-13 gang members. What are they going to start doing? You're going to have a wave of violence that will engulf the country. And what do people do when they are victims of a wave of violence? They want somebody to fix it. And so somebody will come along and use the military to impose law and order on the country. And, and that's why we have a separation. That's why the head of the military in America is the president, not, uh, a, not a general. Uh, we don't have a general in charge of the military as the commander-in-chief. We have the president. The head of the military is a civilian, and that's by design, because our founders knew that that's how you get a totalitarian, authoritarian form of government, is when the, when the military becomes used to advance a political agenda and take things over. That's not how you want uh, to do things. Uh, all right. Uh, so, uh, again, kudos to Jeff for helping me set up that uh, soundbite. Well done. Um, here's another. We're, we're going to talk in the second hour about the Supreme Court deal and how that's going to affect the election in 2018. Here's somebody it could affect, and that's Claire McCaskill in Missouri. She's running for re-election. She was elected in 2012. She's being challenged by Missouri Attorney General Josh Hawley. And what Josh Hawley is doing, he, there's a Republican nomination, so he may not make it. He's the favorite. But let's just assume for the sake of argument that he wins the nomination. He becomes the Republican nominee to face off with Claire McCaskill. What he's doing is he's already hitting her on her misfires when it comes to Supreme Court nominees. This is how he's going to hit her, that she's been wrong on the last five Supreme Court nominees. She opposed Alito and Gorsuch. She was in favor of Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, you know, and she is running in a state that was won by President Trump in 2016. You got three other Democratic senators, Joe Manchin, Joe Donnelly, Heidi Heitkamp, that voted for Gorsuch in 2017, and part of the reason they did is they are in states that Donald Trump won by 20 or more points. So it'll be interesting to see what they do when it comes to Trump's uh, next nominee. You know, in the latest uh, poll, Real Clear Politics keeps an average of polls, so they just take all the polls that are done and compile an average of them. McCaskill is up by 1.7% in Missouri. That is well within the margin of uh, error. Uh, you know, and McCaskill had a big misstep. <laughs> he told you about this. She made this big deal of going on that RV tour of Missouri. Remember that? Yeah. She was going to take an RV tour, just be a person of the people, drive all over the state in her RV and meet people in her RV. Well, what she was doing, she was sending her team in a bus in the RV, and then she was flying on a jet plane, mm -hmm. her private jet plane, and land just in time to run over to the RV and get in it and look like she just <laughs> pulled up in the RV. So anyway, that didn't help her a lot. Nope. So anyway, it looks like she's uh, she's got a battle on her uh, hands there. And remember, this is a this is a seat that the Republicans could have won. Remember, this is the one. Remember, Jeff, we were at uh, we were in in Tampa for the Republican convention yeah. when Todd Aiken did his misfire yeah. uh, on rape. And the Republicans just abandoned him in droves. Nope. I mean, they just peeled out. They peeled away from him so fast, give you nosebleed. Ryan Spravis said we will not give him one penny. Not gonna, And he said that. I think we were there. He said that we're not going to give him one penny yeah. to help him. And he could have won that. He was leading the race against Claire McCaskill at that time. And, you know, he maybe could have said it better. What he said basically was biologically correct. That if a woman is under tremendous stress and ten tension, it interferes with her capacity to conceive. But anyway, uh, Republicans, if they'd come alongside Todd Aiken and said, "Yeah, maybe that was a flub. Uh, let's give him, a, let's give him a, 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 a do-over on that. He's our guy. He's a conservative guy. Believes in our values. Let's get behind him." They could have got him across the finish line, but they just abandoned him 
They abandoned, abandoned Richard Murdoch in Indiana. I think that's probably the seat that Joe Donnelly uh, won. That could have been won by the Republicans. They abandoned Roy Moore. They believed all of those. Uh, Faith, family, freedom, American Family Radio. American Family Association. We're here to inform, equip, and activate individuals to strengthen the moral foundations of American culture. Whether it's praying, signing a petition, or emailing leaders, your involvement is needed every day. Because your immediate involvement is crucial, making it fast and easy is crucial as well. Now you can subscribe to specific alerts at afa.net slash connect. Register, connect, and get connected. Faith, family, freedom. American Family Radio a ministry of the American Family Association. American Family News, I'm Rusty Pugh. President Trump is narrowing his list of potential Supreme Court nominees. Jared Halpern has more. What was a list of about two dozen is thought to be down to a handful of candidates. President Trump has met with or spoken with seven potential Supreme Court nominees, a list that includes Utah Senator Mike Lee. Other candidates are appeals court judges Brett Kavanaugh, Amol Thapar, Amy Coney Barrett, Joan Larson, Raymond Kethledge, and Thomas Hardiman, believed to have been a runner-up when Justice Neil Gorsuch was nominated last year. In Washington, Jared Halpern, Fox News. No repeal and replace, no problem for President Trump as he continues efforts to dismantle Obamacare. Peter Ducey has more with what the president is doing in Donald Trump's America. He said this in June. We've essentially gutted it anyway, and we now have really good stuff coming. The Trump administration has whittled away at the ACA by cutting the budget for advertising and the budget for programs that help consumers sign up for coverage, making it easier for consumers to buy short-term plans and by signing the tax cut bill, which rolled back the individual mandate. So in other words, you pay a lot of money not to have health care. Potential Democratic presidential candidates are talking about the Obamacare fight as one that could kill. Senator Cory Booker said this last month. If people are denied health care, people die. In Washington, Peter Ducey, Fox News. A conservative columnist says he is not tired of President Trump's winning. Chad Groening has more. Robert Knight is a conservative activist and a columnist of the Washington Times. His latest column is called, Are You Tired of Winning Yet? In it, he points out that we should remember when President Trump said we were going to win so much that we are going to get tired of it. A lot of people took President Trump to task for boasting that we'd get tired of winning. We'd win so much you'd get tired of it. We thought he was kidding, but this last month seemed to have proved him right. We've had several key Supreme Court decisions that would not have been made possible if Hillary Clinton had been elected. And Knight says the biggest news involving the Supreme Court was the announcement that Justice Anthony Kennedy is retiring at the end of this month. Justice Kennedy, the architect of some very bad decisions over the years, announcing his retirement and clearing the way for President Trump to be able to appoint a successor more along the lines of Justice Neil Gorsuch, who has been a reliable vote in all these cases. Knight says the president should also benefit from how far to the left Democrats are moving. You have the election in New York of this 28-year-old hardcore leftist, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who knocked off Representative Joe Crowley, who was in line to succeed Nancy Pelosi. He was in the Democratic leadership. And it just shows how far left the Democratic Party has gone. I think they're going to be talking to themselves after November, wondering what happened. Knight begs the question, anyone tired of winning yet? I'm Chad Groening. In Annapolis, Maryland this year, it was not only about celebrating America's independence, but they also honored the victims and survivors of the Capitol Gazette shooting. Fox 5 DC's Lindsay Watts has the story from the parade. Not even a week ago, this city went through the horror of a mass shooting. And today, some of the survivors joined first responders and marched in the Independence Day parade. It was definitely emotional to see the group. Some of the people you see here were hiding under their desks on Thursday as five of their coworkers were killed. I talked to a Gazette photographer who says he's out here every year covering the event. And of course, very different this time around. He says the response from onlookers was very moving, and he saw the love and the depth of the affection from Annapolis. A mom is accused of selling her own child and trying to do the same with her other kids in Texas. 
Police say 29-year-old Esmeralda Garza of Corpus Christi sold her 7-year-old son. The child was found during a drug raid in the area conducted by the State Department of Public Safety. Cops say Garza was in the process of selling her 2- and 3-year-old daughters as well. Authorities arrested two other adults in connection to the case. It is unclear how much money Garza received for the sale of her kid and why. Garza is facing a felony charge of the sale or purchase of a child held on a $100,000 bond. Ken Duffy, Fox News. For American Family News, I'm Rusty Peer. Who is God? What is He like? How can we know? Your answer to these questions will impact your worship, discipleship, apologetics, and evangelism. Learn from Ravi Zacharias, Josh McDowell, Chip Ingram, and more than 60 other speakers at Southern Evangelical Seminary's 25th Annual National Conference on Christian Apologetics. It's October 12th and 13th in Charlotte, North Carolina. Get the early bird discount when you register by August 1st at ses.edu. Last week, the New York Democratic Socialists of America issued a statement of their beliefs. Abolish profit, abolish prisons, abolish cash bail, abolish borders. We don't have ideological diversity within the two major parties. I hear Democrats saying, we want to abandon ICE. We want to abandon, we're not abandoning ICE. We're not abandoning our law enforcement. Just the opposite. Sarah Huckabee has no right to live a life of no fuss, no muss. 78, 78% of Americans do not own a gun. Right, and they're all the liberals. This is a crucial election. 2020 is not the year where the Democrats can run a woman and win. 2020 is not the year where Democrats can run a black person and win. They're gonna have to run a white guy. Freedom prospers when religion is vibrant and the rule of law under God is acknowledged. An informed patriot is what we want. Welcome to American Family Radio's Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. Muscular Christianity. Where we relentlessly explore the intersection of truth and politics. The trouble with our liberal friends is not that they're ignorant. It's just that they know so much that isn't so. Now, here's your host, Brian Fisher. Hi, and welcome to the second hour of Focal Point on American Family Radio. Brian Fisher is my name, congenial, convivial, and amiable. As always, the program is Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. Honored and pleased to welcome to our decision maker line my next guest, Patrick Kolbeck. He is a state senator from Michigan, and he is running for governor of the great state of Michigan. Just to give you a little bit of background before we bring him on, he has uh, degrees in aerospace engineering, so he is literally a rocket scientist. He worked for Boeing, and he worked on projects that enable human beings to live in space. So he's an outstanding uh, rocket scientist. He also knows what it's like for small business owners. He started a business, ran it for about six years. He's uh, been he, he ran for the M Michigan legislature with no political experience, first person in three decades to run and be elected to the state Senate, or the state House for that matter, but Michigan Senate in particular, with no political experience. Uh, was honored as the most conservative senator the past two years in a row, three times in his seven years of service. Uh, he helped to make Michigan the 24th right to work state in the nation, received a kind of a Senator, a Statesman of the Year award, named in honor of Senator Paul Fannin because he uh, of his work in the Senate He's been featured by Forbes because of some of his ideas. Honored as the Legislator of the Year by the Police Officers Association of Michigan, the Senior Alliance, Associated Builders and Contractors. Patrick Kolbeck, uh, welcome to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Thanks for taking time to chat with us. Hey, it's great to be with you, Brian. I think my wife might have provided you with that bio <laughs> a little long. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't see any reason why everybody listening to me right now shouldn't just go out right now and cast a, uh, you know, cast a uh, uh, pre-election ballot for you. But uh, Patrick, well, they, go ahead. They are voting now. <laughs> yeah. Now, what do they call that? Early voting? Is that what they call it? Absentee voting. Absentee voting. That's what I'm trying to think of. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, Patrick Kolbeck is my guest. As I mentioned, a candidate for a governor in the state of Michigan. You've got three Republican uh, competitors in the race. And, uh, Patrick, for our listeners, and those that live in Michigan or have relatives, family members in Michigan, you've got three Republican competitors. How would you 
distance yourself, separate yourself, distinguish yourself from the other three Republicans that are in the race? Well, I think the best way to start out is highlighting that as an engineer, I'm always focused on solutions. They're very good at the talking points. They're very good with the glossy brochures and the one-minute sound bites. Um, I'm one of those guys that's always struggling to find a way to fit all aspects of the solution into a one-minute reply when it comes to debate. So if you're looking for somebody with a depth of solution that knows how to solve problems, right, we've got big problems like fixing the roads, our health care system, not just uh, statewide but also nationally as an issue. And uh, as the bio talked about, we've put forward solutions that have actually helped more than just Michigan. It's been, we've been advocating for free market health care solutions across the country. And sometimes it's tough to squeeze that into a soundbite. So that's the biggest differentiator is that the other guys are very good on the talking points. And uh, I tend to be much better on actually fixing things. <laughs> uh, do you happen to know, Patrick, do you happen to know, by the way, Gary Glenn in, in the state of Absolutely. Michigan? Absolutely. He's a very... Yeah. Very good friend of mine. Be Give him a greeting for me next time you chat with him. I will do, yeah. He's fighting against Common Core just like we did. And actually, Gary, early on when we were putting together our strategy for making Michigan a right-to-work state, he was right in there at the beginning helping to guide us on some of his experience. Mm -hmm. So you worked together with him and other legislators to make Michigan the 24th right-to-work state in the country. Now, yeah. um it's all about at, freedom and getting that freedom of assembly back to our rank and file workers. Yes, yes. And that's what it's really about. That's a First Amendment right, the freedom to peaceably assemble. As long as your purpose is getting together, doesn't have any violence attached to it, you're free to assemble according to the Constitution without any interference from uh, the government. Now, Absolutely. Uh, Patrick, let's talk for a second about, you know, one of the issues that we follow on this program because it's such a, such a blossoming issue is the restriction of free speech on college campuses. And yeah. you, I know, became concerned about the same thing. What did you do about that? Well, I introduced some legislation that uh, um, design was designed to make sure that we didn't uh, allow people that are shouting down people and trying to um, censor their point of view. We, we decided to start uh, putting forward uh, legislation that would penalize the people restricting free speech. <laughs> rather than the folks trying to exercise their free speech, which is the way the system is set up right now. And this has implications across the board, not just at our college campuses, but, uh, but uh, in, our, in our curriculum that we're teaching in K-12 through systems as well. And it's, uh, and it's important because they're only pushing one side of the issue in our college campuses. They only allow one perspective to be pushed. But if you're from a conservative worldview, it seems like we're silenced um, more often than uh, the folks on the other side of the equation. Hmm. And so you sponsored legislation to make campuses and the, the public colleges and community colleges and, and universities yep. in Michigan open to free speech so you don't have any kind of restrictions that we've seen. Now, uh, we have a very... Well, we actually, the fun part about that legislation is we actually teamed up with the Goldwater Institute and the ACLU, so about as diametrically opposed as you can get, <laughs> and we got them both to agree on the legislation, and... So uh, it's tough moving it through the system sometimes because of politics. And when you're running for governor and the uh, committee chair is not a big fan of you, it kind of tends to stall things a little bit. But yeah. we got the folks uh, who needed to, who were affected by the policy on the same page. Well, you know, and it shows, uh, uh, talking here with Patrick Colbeck, go a candidate for governor in Michigan, it just shows, Patrick, we're not opposed to crossing the aisle and working with people who have a different political worldview exactly. as long as they're prepared to do the right thing. And that's what the ACLU Absolutely. was willing to do in your case, and so you happily worked with them on a free speech issue. Right. We did the same thing in our social study standards as well. Uh, back in 2015, they proposed uh, what I thought was kind of a, an indoctrination uh, set of standards that were very much biased towards a left-wing uh, perspective on our history and our civics. And I said, time for a little balance. And I got together with about uh, 20 other members of a focus group, and I had one obje or two objectives. Whatever we came up with had to be politically neutral and had to be accurate. So if you wanted to talk about progressive policies, then we're going to talk about conservative policies. If you want to talk about LGBT rights as a civil right, then I want to talk about religious conscience as a civil right. If you want to talk about the rise of Islam, then, by gosh, you know, maybe we should talk about the rise of Christianity. After mm -hmm. all, we are here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you one last question. It's kind of a two-part sure. question. We've got about 60 seconds left. We've got, to be, we've got a hard break coming up at 2.15.
So uh, what did you do? Everybody was running toward Obamacare, Medicare expansion, what, or Medicaid expansion. What was your position on that? What about the adoption of Common Core? And then lastly, yeah. tell us how your Christian faith, we have a very faith-friendly audience here, how does your Christian faith inform your politics? Well, let's start with the last one because it's most important. I'm, I've taken to heart 2 Timothy 1.7, for God didn't give us a spirit of timidity, but one of power, love, and self-control, which means I'll take on the, the battle that other people won't take on, and I'll do so in love and truth. Um, when it comes to Common Core, um, the truth of the matter is it ain't working. It's a failed experiment on our kids, and it needs to go. And I think, what was the other one that you wanted to talk about? A Medicaid expansion, and then... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so we want to take care of the poor, but there's a better way of doing it. It's by lowering the cost of health care for everybody. If you do that, you can improve the access to care. We've got a pilot on Medicaid right now around direct primary care that promises to save taxpayers money and get people who need Medicaid better care. And it's a great win-win-win for everybody. Our guest has been Patrick Kolbeck candidate for governor in the state of Michigan. Patrick, thank you for taking time to chat with us, and God bless you in your campaign. Here's Twyla Brace, president of CCHF, with today's Health Freedom Minute. Welcome to Health Freedom 101, Session 1. What does health freedom look like? It would have true health insurance instead of today's managed care health plans. True insurance is the traditional indemnity policies that protect against catastrophic and chronic conditions. They don't dictate treatment decisions, and they don't cover routine and minor care. You'd pay for those costs out of your pocket and not submit them to the insurer. Insurance is solely for insurable events, catastrophic and long-term events that threaten financial disaster. Thus, it would be rarely used. The Affordable Care Act prohibits the purchase of true insurance except in limited situations. Health freedom requires repealing or bypassing that prohibition. Learn more about protecting your health care choices. Sign up for the CCHF Weekly E-News Update at cchfreedom.org. That's cchfreedom.org. Oops, there's a piece I missed a little bit. Grandpa, why do we always pick up litter when we go hiking? Well, we're just making it nicer for people who come after us a little bit. It's called stewardship. My grandfather taught me that you should always leave a place better than you found it. That it's important to invest in the lives of your children and grandchildren, leaving them with a godly legacy they can build on. That's why I decided to set up a charitable gift annuity with the AFA Foundation. It's called stewardship. I know that my gift will support a ministry that honors the biblical principles I hold dear, and it's a way to invest in the future of our country. The AFA Foundation also arranged for me to have a steady fixed income, so I don't have to worry in the midst of changing times. Call the AFA Foundation today to find out how you can set up a charitable gift annuity. Just call 800-326-4543, extension 345. This is Focal Point with Brian Fisher on American Family Radio. Howdy and welcome back to Focal Point on American Family Radio. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Patrick Colbeck the first time I had chatted with him. But it seems to me, for conservatives in Michigan, he would be an outstanding choice. I'm not endorsing him. We don't do that here. I can do that in my private capacity, but not on there and not on behalf of American Family Association. Uh, it seems to me he would make an outstanding choice for conservatives looking for somebody who's a fighter for conservative causes. He was known, by the way, as the Ted Cruz of Michigan because of his willingness to take hard stands and not budge. Patrick Kolbeck. Uh, candidate for governor of Michigan. Let's listen to Chuck Todd. This is clip number one. And this is a weird thing he says in clip number one. Let's listen to it and let's pick it apart. What's the problem with our current polarized political situation? One of the things I argue is, for instance, that we don't have ideological diversity within the two major parties. And what it sounds like you're arguing is that's why you left. I think that's why some on the right may leave soon because of what's happening there, that you're not allowed to be, you're not allowed to have diverse opinions within that tent. So I say no ideological diversity in either the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. I don't know where that guy has been since Donald Trump came on the scene. I mean, Republicans, you got this whole batch of never Trumpers. I mean, they're, they're becoming rapidly becoming extinct and irrelevant. Nobody's paying any attention to them anymore. 
there's some very bright people that are never Trumpers, and they're still beating on their pots and pans, and nobody is paying attention. Uh, so there is ideological diversity in both parties, particularly between the two parties. As an example of some of that ideological diversity, let's go to clip number four. This is Donald Trump speaking at White Sulphur Springs and talking about this uh, abolish ICE movement. These people want to abolish ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which um, uh, essentially means no borders. It means open borders. There's, there's, you're no longer a nation. You no longer have borders. If you don't have ICE, there's nobody to uh, enforce immigration and customs law. So that's what they're calling for. And here Donald Trump responds to that in clip four. These guys, they walk into those areas. They take them out of there so fast. They're not afraid of anything. It is. It's like you're liberating a town. Like in a war, you're liberating a town or an area. And ICE goes in there, and they go in there, and sometimes they have to go in swinging. They don't mind. They're tough. And then I hear Democrats saying, we want to abandon ICE. We want to abandon. We're not abandoning ICE, and we're not abandoning our law enforcement. Just the opposite. So Donald Trump saying we're going to strengthen our enforcement of ICE, strengthen our enforcement along the southern border doubling down on the importance of ICE. We're not going to back away from them. We're not going to abolish them. In fact, we're doing just exactly the opposite. In fact, Donald Trump doubled down over the weekend, uh, not over the weekend, but over the holiday, on the whole uh, issue of what we do with people that we apprehend at the border. I want to remind you that when President Obama was talking about how great his deportation stats were, what he was counting in deportation is people that they apprehended at the border and sent right back home. And Barack Obama counted those as deportations, not interior enforcement, but border enforcement, where they never got in the country. They apprehended taking their first step on American soil, were sent home. President Obama did that, counted them as deportations so he could pad his stats. But Donald Trump, uh, doubling down on his commitment to do that, to find a way to do that. We apprehend illegals at the border. We turn right around and we send them back to where they came from. Now, talk about ideological diversity. There is one opinion, Republican Party, the leader of the Republican Party, President Trump. We are going to double down on ICE. We're going to double down our enforcement of the border. Now, here is Tom Perez, who is the head, officially, of the Democratic Party. He's the chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Listen to what he says about where he's at ideologically. What's this tell you about where the Democratic Party's going today? Well, I, I, uh, my daughters, uh, I have three kids, two of whom are, are daughters. Uh, one just graduated college, one is in college, and they were both uh, uh, texting me about their excitement over Alexandria because you know, she, really, she represents the future of our party. Uh, she ran a spirited campaign. All right, Tom Perez, head of the Democratic Party, Alexandria Ocasio Perez. I think that's her last name. I have trouble remembering that. Anyway, um, no, Cortez, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Tom Perez is saying she is the future of the Democratic Party, and she is a hardcore, no apologies, socialist. She's part of the abolish ICE crowd. She wants to abolish prisons. Uh, she wants to abolish borders, and she wants to abolish cash bail. She wants to get rid of all of those things, uh, prisons, borders, uh, profit. She wants nobody making any money in the United States of America. So, that's, you know, I mean, it's just nutso stuff that she's for. And Tom Perez says this woman is the future of the Democratic Party. That future leads directly to oblivion. Now, um, get an idea of the ideological diversity within the Republican Party. Here is Jen Rubin. She is supposed to be the conservative columnist for the Washington Post. By the way, we'll start taking your calls in this next segment. The number to call if you want to join our conversation is 888-589-8840, 888 888- 589-8840 is the number to call if you'd like to join our conversation about the difference between the Democratic Party, Republican Party, Donald Trump, immigration, Patrick Kolbeck, candidate for governor in Michigan. 
Love to get your take on any of that. Give us a call, 888-589-8840. So here's Jennifer Rubin, who is a so-called conservative point of view in the Washington Post. And remember the Sarah Sanders getting harassed, run out of this restaurant, the Red Hen restaurant, got run right out of there. And Jennifer Rubin is responding to what these people were doing to Sarah Sanders. And here's her take on it as a fellow so-called Republican or conservative. No one's telling them to be violent protesters, but we're not gonna let these people go through life unscathed. Sarah Huckabee has no right to live a life of no fuss, no muss, after lying to the press, after inciting against the press. These people should be made uncomfortable, and I think that's a life sentence, frankly. So, Jennifer Rubin, Sarah Sanders has no right to her own life. She has no right to live a life where she is free from constant harassment. She must be made to feel the pain. And she says this is a life sentence. That means that even after she stopped being the president's spokesperson, I'm going to call her a spokesman because I believe in the generic use of language, uh, at long after Sarah Sanders is no longer the president's spokesman, Jennifer Rubin still wants her harassed right up to the end of her life. She wants this to be a life sentence. I think it's time to take that coexist bumper sticker off her car. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. Now, here's another Jennifer Rubin clip, clip number seven. And she's talking here about what will happen if President Trump nominates to the Supreme Court a pro-life candidate. And by that, I mean just somebody who believes in the Constitution. As Antonin Scalia said... There is no constitutional right to abortion. You know why? Because it isn't in the Constitution. There's no word in the Constitution where you find the word abortion and the right to practice abortion. That's not in there. It's not in there anywhere. And that means, according to the Tenth Amendment, that's an issue for the states to decide. But anyway, Jennifer Rubin is responding to the possibility that Trump could nominate somebody who would issue a ruling on a, ro a revisiting a Roe v. Wade according to the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, and what would happen if Roe v. Wade were overturned and the issue went back to the states. Here's what Jan Rubin said about that. The people who brought Donald Trump and delivered him to the White House want this, and I think they will not be disappointed. So then the question is, if they're not able to withstand this onslaught, um, not able to uh, hold back a uh, justice that would reverse Roe, what happens? In essence, we go to 50 civil wars in each of the states plus the District of Columbia. And here is where I think the Republicans have badly overplayed their hand. So she thinks the Republicans have overplayed their hand on this. And she says there will be 50 civil wars. And I don't know if she means that in a violent sense. There are definitely going to be culture wars in those 50 states as the le state legislators grapple with, grapple with what should have been their decision all the way along. Do we want to legalize abortion in our state or do we want to criminalize the slaughter and dismembering of innocent human babies? What do we want to do? Do we want to allow this child murder to continue in our state or are we going to criminalize it? and start punishing the doctors. I say we go after the doctors that perform these abortions. What are we going to do? And Jennifer Rubin says, well, we're going to have 50 civil wars. Maybe so. It's going to be, it's going to, I know it is going to be very, very intense. I do not believe that the Republicans would have overplayed their hand. And besides, when you're talking about principle, it doesn't matter if you overplayed your hand or not. If what you're doing is right, if what you're pressing for is right and correct and true, which is protecting innocent life in the womb, then it's not a political issue of who overplays their hand or underplays their hand. So, so much for Jennifer Rubin as a uh, spokesman for the Republican Party. A lot of ideological diversity there. Jennifer Rubin is a one-woman ideological diversity example in the Republican Party. Now, here is Susan Collins, clip number eight. And uh, she's kind of gone beyond where she went before. She said earlier... If there's a candidate that is hostile, has hostility to Roe v. Wade, I can't support her. She's gone further in this soundbite. Let's listen. I think I've made it pretty clear that if a nominee has demonstrated hostility to Roe v. Wade and has said uh, that they're not going to abide by that longstanding precedent, 
uh, that I could not support so you need that, that nominee. Now. But it's not, we don't even know who the nominee sure, is. I've say. already told you that the person demonstrates hostility towards Roe v. Wade and doesn't consider it to be settled law and precedent. I, I don't see how I can vote to that for, for that person. Okay, so now she's changed the goalpost, moved the goalpost a little bit. Susan Connick saying if she doesn't support that is not willing to abide by the precedent of Roe v. Wade, if she's not willing to agree that the Supreme Court decision of 1973 established the law of the land and is not willing to abide by that precedent, I'm not going to be able to uh, support her. You know, and, or him. You know, and um, Mark Levin said, look, if, you're, if you want to make precedent paramount, you're going to get into trouble in a big hurry. Think about Korematsu versus the United States. That's the Supreme Court ruling that it's okay to intern Japanese Americans in mass. You want to uphold that precedent? What about Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896? That was the separate but equal segregation for blacks. You going to uphold that precedent? What about the Dred Scott case, which said we can have slavery in the United States? Are you willing to uphold that precedent or overturn it? Be right back. Focal Point, American Family Radio. Through the years, many Christians have asked me how to discover God's will for their life. The well-known Bible teacher, Henry Blackaby, has an answer that is well worth considering. He says, learning to follow God's ways may be more important than making sincere attempts to do His will. God wants to complete His work through you. He can only do that as you adjust your life to Him and to His ways. I agree. When we get in step with God, following His ways in all of our life, we will in time discover His specific calling for our life. God's ways come before God's will. And this is David Jeremiah encouraging you to get on the road to new life. Discover God's ways on Route 66. Route 66, driving the word home. Log on to Route66life.com. Start your journey home today. Here on American Family Radio, this is David Wolin with Haven Ministries, inviting you to anchor your day in God's Word. How did you decide where to live? Was it your job, your family? How about income, schools, neighborhoods, taxes, renting versus owning? Probably all that and more. But what if God orchestrated where you live for a greater purpose? Speaking of God intersecting humanity, the Bible says that God marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him. Now, if God's plans for where and when people live is all about them coming to know Him, don't you think that's also true for you and your neighbors? God has a heart for them, do you? Get more encouragement for your daily walk with Jesus with Anchor Devotional. Try it out at GetAnchor.com. American Family Radio. You're listening to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Video segments of today's program will be posted at AFR.net and on the Focal Point Facebook page. You'll also find the best collection of Brian's resources on our Facebook page. If you're on Twitter, be among the very first every morning to find out what the day's show will be about. Just follow Brian at Brian J. Fisher. Brian J. Fisher. Howdy, and welcome back to Focal Point American Family Radio. You know, I read a column this over the weekend that reminded me of some great things that uh, Calvin Coolidge said in a speech that he gave on the 150th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. You know, and this is uh, actually pretty great. Um, let's see if I can find it here. i got to get to it in my little copy of the Constitution. Uh, let's see. Where is my copy of the Declaration? Here we go. You know, and, and the point that Calvin Coolidge made is all these people talking about being progressives and progressing and moving forward. And he says, look, if you set aside any part of the Declaration of Independence, the only way you can go is backwards because this is the pinnacle. The, the principles that are articulated and enshrined in the Declaration, they are final in his words. 
In other words, he said, if all men are created equal, then that's final. There's nowhere you can go from that other than in reverse. That's why I call them regressives. Leave behind any part of the declaration, they're going in reverse. If you say that men are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that is final. There's no way to go. There's nowhere to go from there other than backwards. If you say that among their fundamental rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that is final. There's no way to go from there other than backwards becoming a regressive in the process. Well, let's take some phone calls here. Let's grab a call from Susan in Memphis, from which 30,000 people left in the last seven years, Susan, because of the politics in Memphis. Anyway, go ahead. What's on your mind? Hi, Brian. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm living in Memphis now with my family. My husband, he's a West Point grad. I served in the Navy. He graduated from West Point and then for 20 years and retired. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're But I was raised in Chicago. I'm Hispanic. I'm an immigrant. Uh, I became a citizen on um, the bicentennial anniversary, you know, in 1976, I think, I, I became a naturalized citizen. Cool. But when I was living in Chicago, you know, and, and I'm a, I have a doctorate, so, you know, I, I, I praise God I'm here in the United States because, you know, I got my education here. My family's here. My parents came. They brought me as immigrants. Anyway, I was standing in one of the grocery stores in Chicago in line, and I'm profiled all the time. This one older woman, she was European. My mom worked in a, in a factory, and so I, I got a ear, I, I could tell the European accent. She turns around, I didn't say a word to her, she turns around, looked at me and said, why don't you go back to where you came from? And you're saying she said, that with, she said that with a European accent? Yes. A <laughs> <laughs> wow. European accent. Oh, wow. She me. She profiled me. I look, I look Hispanic, but you know, I, I'm also, um, I love the Lord. I'm a Christian. So, so and in other words, Susan, she profiled you based on the color of your skin, which is, which whatever else is un-American, that's it. To make a decision about somebody, to prejudge somebody uh, based on the color of their skin, we are flatly opposed to that. But she did that, didn't ask whether you were a citizen, no. uh, didn't ask whether you no. had a Christian faith. No. She just, just jumped all over you. No. She, I didn't say a word to her, so she didn't know whether I spoke English, Spanish, and you know, Greek, Mediterranean, because you know, we have olive skin, you know. I, I, I could have been Filipino or Mediterranean, for all she knew. And, and because I didn't say anything to her, she didn't know that I spoke perfect English, like, like I'm speaking to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm bilingual, I speak Spanish. And she just looked at me, and she, like, like with disdain, she said, why don't you go back to where, from where you came from? And because I, I'm, I love the Lord and I'm God-fearing, I thought, you know, this lady was probably mistreated or, or something by someone who may have had dark skin or Mediterranean skin or olive skin. And, you know, she profiled me, maybe with some experience she had in the past. Mm-hmm. And here she said that to me. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things, you know, one of the things, Susan, that uh, you might be right about that. I'm guessing maybe she's had a bad experience in other places. But that's one of the reasons why we need a secure border. So we don't have people coming across the border that uh, that don't belong here and that are going to arouse an understandable resentment on the part of Americans that do have the right to be here. That's part of it. Because if she did have that experience, and part of that is due to lack of immigration control, which we want to try to shore up under President Trump. That's the truth. Isn't that the truth? My dad, I'll tell you, he did come here illegally in the, in the mid-50s. But then he was deported. He saw Ellis Island on the way out. Huh. However, he got back to the country of origin. He made applications to come to the United States legally. <laughs> And at that time, he had to he had to get five hundred dollars and have two sponsors in the U.S. Yeah, and that's a lot of money back in the mid fifties. Yeah, which he did. And the idea so behind he, and Susan, the idea behind those sponsors was that the the immigrant who came to the states, who was invited to the states, permitted to come in, would not become a drain on 
the resources of the taxpayers of America. That's why they had to have a sponsor. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. You know, as you know, our hospital, I, I'm a health care provider. Well, I've worked in hospitals my whole life. And I, emergency rooms are flooded sometimes with immigrants, with illegal aliens. You know, we call them aliens because that's, that's the word. I'm sorry. Some people mm -hmm. are offended. That's the word. <laughs> yeah. Not a, no one should be offended, but if you look at the dictionary, that's the word. Yeah, nothing pejorative about it. It's just accurate. Yeah. yeah, and so, uh, and, and our school systems, uh, our resources are being depleted by people who are not here legally. And what happens to our kids that are born mm -hmm. here, that, that are hungry? I see commercials all the time, feed me, feed me. And these are, these are kids that live here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, uh, when, you, when you try to educate children that do not speak the native language and have to kind of learn it on the fly. They're just not able to learn at the same rate as somebody who's grown up in this country or comes to this land speaking the language. And therefore, if they're going to be mainstream, which they are, that's the whole push in education, that means that the entire learning pace of the whole class is going to be slowed down to accommodate the learning rate of this individual whose language skills are challenged. And so you're penalizing everybody in that class in order to do some kind of favor to this one uh, I illegal alien student. So you have a great point, Susan. I appreciate it. Well, listen, thank you very much for the call. Thank you for your service, and, and God bless you. Thanks for taking time to chat with us. Thanks. Susan from Memphis. All right, let's go to Kathy, Connolly Springs, North Carolina. Kathy, welcome. What's on your mind? Hey, Brian. Hey. Um, I had a thought a few, I guess a couple years ago, um, about the Democratic Party just needs to be dismantled because they are the party of of uh, no message. And so I was thinking about it, and you know how the left are wanting to abolish ICE. Well, I thought, well, maybe we can start a, a um, program to uh, um, get rid of the Democratic Democratic Party and say we can abolish the Democratic Party. <laughs> Instead of abolish ICE, let's abolish the Democratic Party. That's it. Yeah, that's something that that's just it. might uh, catch on, Kathy. Well, listen, I appreciate that call. Thank you for that. Let's grab a call from Mac in Albany, Georgia. Mac, welcome. What's on your mind? Thank you, Ryan. If we keep on letting them go, and they're doing a pretty good job, of, I hope, of abolishing their cell. But, uh, yeah, they are. Like, the lady that was talking to me, Mrs. Sandra, she said that she said you just have to expect this. I mean, like she was supposed to be a Republican, I think. He said I call them Republicans. Mm -hmm. I wish people like that could be voted out of office uh, if they're not fully for. But either that, or she reminded me of Maxine Waters, and she's a Republican. Thank you, Brian. All right, Mac, I appreciate that. And you know, thinking of what we were talking about here. Uh, we have an opportunity. I mean, well, let, let, let me rephrase that. Republicans have an opportunity to abolish the Democratic Party at the polls. The Democrats increasingly are making themselves virtually unelectable. You know, we saw that, what was it, 74% of the American people flatly reject socialism. Only 13% support it. 74 to 13, reject socialism. And yet Tom Perez, the head of the Democratic Party, says Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is an out-and-out out socialist, I mean, she's more of a socialist than Bernie Sanders, she, he says, is the future of the Democratic Party. Number to call, by the way, we'll take more calls going into the next uh, segment, is 888-589-8840. Now, talking about the... Uh, Supreme Court nomination. Let's grab clip number R1. No, no, no. Let, uh, since we're talking about the Democratic Party, let's go to clip number nine. This is Jason Johnson. He's an MSNBC political contributor. And here's what he had to say about the presidential election in 2020 and who the Democrats need to run. Jason. McAuliffe, Joe Biden. 
those are the only real candidates that Democrats have if they're going to run against Donald Trump in 2020. This is a crucial election. We have seen what has happened, how conversations and narratives have been transformed with him only being in office for 18 months. 2020 is not the year where the Democrats can run a woman and win. 2020 is not the year where Democrats can run a black person and win. They're going to have to run a white guy, and it's going to be a white guy. Going to be a white guy. Now, Jason Johnson is a black guy himself. Now, if a white guy was saying this, you had a white pundit saying, look, the Democrats cannot run a, uh, a, wh- a white man and win or a white woman and win. That'd be one thing. he would be accused of stereotyping and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but Jason Johnson says they got to run a white guy. Can't run a black guy. Can't run a white woman. They got to run a white guy. Sounds like racial stereotyping to me. And this is unfortunate news just breaking now that uh, Scott Pruitt has resigned from his position with the Environmental Protection Agency. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a real blow because what Scott Pruitt was determined to do was dismantle all of the labyrinth of regulations, environmental regulations that were completely cobbing up American productivity. And he was going through there slashing and burning, getting rid of them one by one. Uh, He, I think he just made some mistakes in judgment. It cost him. He's now out of a job. I hope that Donald Trump will find somebody just as committed to deregulate the EPA. Focal Point American Family Radio. We'll be right back with more of your calls. Stay with us. Is God calling you to pursue theological graduate education? What's keeping you from taking the first step? Is it time? What if you could choose from flexible class options? Is it money? What if competitively priced seminary offered academic scholarships? Do you think you're alone? What if your classmates were just like you, balancing careers and families with seminary? Hello, I'm Dr. John Nyhoff, president of Wesley Biblical Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. Take the first step. Visit wbs.edu. Exposing Washington reveals the deception that plagues our nation's capital. The mainstream media refuses to tell the truth of what's really happening. Exposing Washington brings clarity to the news coming out of Washington, D.C. The American people must stay informed on what our government is doing. Exposing Washington with Walker Wildman brings you the inside scoop of what's happening at our nation's capital. We must take our country back. Each Saturday at 2.30 p.m. Central on American Family Radio. Hi, I'm Will Addison. And I'm Miki Addison of Aaron the Addisons on Urban Family Talk. Family is so important to everything. I mean, think about it. Right after God created Adam, he made family by creating Eve as his wife. We'd like to invite you to the Marriage, Family, and Life Conference this summer. We'll have a full slate of experts to help encourage and equip the body of Christ to fight for the restoration of the family. Our speakers include Ryan Bomberger of the Radiance Foundation, Dr. Clarence Schuler of Building Lasting Relationships, Abraham Hamilton III, Pastor Burt Harper and his wife Jan, and more. We'll even be there. The Marriage, Family, and Life Conference will be Friday and Saturday, August 17th and 18th at Hope Church in Tupelo, Mississippi. Come help us fight back against the enemy's direct attack on marriage and family. That's the Marriage, Family, and Life Conference put on by Urban Family Communications, a division of the American Family Association. You can learn more and register at urbanfamilytalk.com. American Family Radio. You're listening to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Focal Point, Brian Fisher. Howdy and welcome back to the last segment of today's edition of Focal Point on American Family Radio. Brian Fisher is my name. Great to have you in the conversation. Talking about a lot of different things today. Let's play one more clip on the election. The number to call, by the way, is 888-589-8840. 888-589-8840. Uh, let's pick up a clip from Sean Trendy, who's with Real Clear Politics. And he's a pretty, a pretty neutral, pretty objective observer of the political scene, and he specializes in sort of analyzing elections. And uh, here's what he has to say about the election in November, how things looked six months ago, and how they look today. 
Well, I think if you looked six months ago, you would say it was it was doomsday for Republicans um, with the president down in the mid 30s and the generic ballot, which asks who you would prefer to control Congress, showing a double digit lead for Democrats. Um, but that's just not the world we're in today. The president is up into the low to mid 40s in his job approval. This generic ballot is his close to a four point lead for the Democrats. So I think we've gone from Democrats being heavy favorites to take the House to something of a dead heat and maybe even a little bit of thumb on the scale for the Republicans. Shoshan Trendy saying things have changed in the last six months today said you'd probably have to give the edge actually to the Republicans. So we're not looking at a blue wave right now. At least I think Sean Trendy's analysis is right on point here. I don't think we're looking at a blue wave at all. In fact, I would see the Republicans protecting their lead in the Senate, maybe picking up some Senate seats and I think holding on to their edge in the House. I don't think they're in danger of losing either. You know, speaking of the Second Amendment, let's go to clip R2. A lot of conversation about civil war. Uh, a lot of Democrats talking about this. I think according to a Reuters poll we saw earlier this week, 32% of the American people believe that we're going to have a civil war in the next five years. I hope to God, I pray to God that we don't have that. But what they're picking up is the level of tension right now and division in America is so high and we are just one short step away from it turning in to violence. Now, Michael Moore and Bill Maher are discussing this in clip R2, and they realize that the left has a massive problem <laughs> if they're thinking about getting involved in a civil war with people on the right. You know, I was going to ask you about bowling for Columbine, yeah. about guns. Yeah. Now that fascism's coming to America and their side has all the guns, <laughs> Any second thoughts? 78% 78, 78 of Americans do not own a gun. Right, and they're all the liberals. And there's, <laughs> right, there's, there's seven, That's there's what seven, worries me. There's 7 million Americans that own 160 million guns. They have stockpiled them. This is, this is the elephant in the room in terms of the discussion of what are we all going to do, putting our bodies on the line, what does that really mean? We'll do it nonviolently, but we, people are afraid. No. And we don't have, we don't own the guns, but there's more of us, and I think the military is still That's with us. Question. And they've got bigger guns and more guns, and I well, hope it never that, comes to that. Well, you know, so Michael Moore is saying, we don't have any guns, <laughs> but the military does, and they got bigger guns than we do, and we think they're still with us. I don't think he's anywhere close to being right about where the military is at on this particular by the time we get more toward the end of the Trump administration, where he's uh, celebrating the military, where he's funding the military, I think his numbers are going to be much higher uh, down the road than even they are now. Yeah, he's talking about socialism and, and a dictator takeover if you bring in the military involved, you know, mm -hmm. what we talked about earlier. Yeah, yeah he's, he's talking like let's use the military to advance our political agenda. Man, that's how you get Argentina. That's, that's how you right. get Venezuela. Venezuela. Yeah. That's how you just get dictatorships. Cuba. It's the know, last thing we want to see, how you get Cuba, where you got to pack your own toilet paper. So um, executive producer kind of admonished me for emphasizing that point too often on <laughs> Tuesday. Well, it's When truth. I said the yeah. only thing you need to know, <laughs> and then I said it again, the only, only thing, thing you need to know. And she said, we got you the first time. <laughs> the only thing you need to know about a socialist country is you got to pack your own toilet paper when you visit. And, there. A, and I, a toilet seat is a luxury. Yeah, it, uh, that's, that's true. Yeah. I had forgot about that. That's exactly right. The toilet seat is a luxury there. Can't even count on having that. Now, speaking of the Supreme Court, just for a quick second, clip R1. This is Michelle Goldberg. She is a columnist for the New York Times. Here's what she had to say about this vacancy that Anthony Kennedy has created. This is Kennedy betraying the country. The Democrats it's could not. have done very He's little. He's holding for 30 he years. Has, He's not betraying he the country. Has we should thank an him obligation for his to not Why let Trump. Why do you have Trump to demean people in that? Because, making your point? because they you are have destroying a valid point to make. this country. You don't need to demean they people are, like that. He is just he sat up there. He was the sole arbiter of justice for all these years, and then when the country needed him most, you know he stepped aside. <laughs> so Michelle Goldberg said Anthony Kennedy betrayed this country by stepping down and creating a vacancy on the court. Latest word from the Associated Press is that the Donald Trump's finalist list is down to three. Amy Coney Barrett, Brett Kavanaugh, and Raymond Kethledge. 
I've already explained why we here at American Family Association really like Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, Brett Kavanaugh, we believe, have some, has some weaknesses. He provided the argumentation that John Roberts used to uh, legalize Obamacare. So that makes uh, Brett Kavanaugh suspicious in our minds. And also, he, he said that he could see how the state could have a compelling interest in forcing employers to mandate abortion coverage be provided or abortion pills be provided or contraceptive pills, rather, be provided by the employers. So that makes us a little nervous about him. But according to some sources this morning, he's now the front runner, Donald Trump's list. I do believe he wants to appoint a woman to the Supreme Court, a conservative woman, and that would give the edge, I think, to, uh, to Amy Coney Barrett. But that's going to be a, a challenging confirmation. We've already seen, you know, Susan Collins saying can't vote for somebody who doesn't regard it as a as binding uh, precedent. Uh, all right, one other thing, and then we'll go back to the phones. The mayor of London, Donald Trump, is planning to go over to England. The mayor of London, are you ready for this? The mayor of London. This guy's supposed to be a sober. He's a Muslim, by the way. But the mayor of London, and it's under his leadership there. They've had this just this. The storm of knife attacks, uh, he is going to allow, he's appro- given his approval to a giant blimp of Donald Trump in a diaper to be flown over the city of London while the president is making a visit to the UK. Ridiculous. He also also is making a uh, restriction he's not allowed to visit with Nigel Farage while he's there. Yeah, he well, won't, won't let him meet with Nigel Farage. I think that's probably somebody in the British government, parliament, or something like that. But anyway, all right, well, let's go to the phones, finish up with some phone calls. Let's go quickly to Keith in Paris, Tennessee. Keith, welcome. What's on your mind? Talk to me. Keith, are you there? Hello? Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, gotcha. I'm here. Can you hear? Yeah, I can hear oh, you. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, uh, I've been a Trump supporter from the word go, but I just ran into something this week that just floored me. I just bought a piece of equipment that was about two miles across the border in Canada, and I was told if I don't get that thing across the border, it's going to be a, uh, an extra $2,000 uh, tariff on that equipment, which is about five years old and made in Italy. And it's because it's made out of steel. And because of the, the tariffs that Trump has established and Canadians' response to that? No, that's the United States charging that for it to get into the United States. So it's it's a tariff that's imposed by the United States. Well, the United States is imposing that twenty five percent tariff yeah. uh, on steel. Well, and and Keith, this is why I've said this is where I disagree flatly and vigorously with Donald Trump. Tariffs are a really really bad idea for the reason that Keith is talking about. To people, it's a tax on the American consumer. That's what Donald Trump does not understand. The people that are going to pay that tariff are going to be ordinary Americans like Keith. Just wants to buy a piece of machinery. All of a sudden, there's a $2,000 add-on to that thing. If he doesn't get it across the border before that tariff goes into effect. Well, that's what happens. It's the American people that pay. It's good for people in the steel industry, steel producing industry, to have those tariffs. Protects their jobs. But there's maybe 40, 60,000 people that work in steel production. There are maybe four to 600,000 people that work in industries or manufacturing that use steel. So those jobs, every one of those jobs now is being placed in jeopardy uh, in order to protect the jobs of the steel workers. So anyway, that's why I oppose Trump on the tariffs. All right, let's go to Clifford in Besiris, Ohio. Clifford, welcome. What's on your mind? Talk to me. Yeah. I've listened to you for quite a while now. Thank you. I enjoy your show. Thank you very much. I think you you cover things great. I love all your opinions. I just got just a couple comments to make. All right. It's, uh, I just can't believe the American people don't stand up to their representatives in Congress and everything. And the way they have trashed our government mm-hmm. and our laws. Yeah. I mean, if you look at our immigration laws, they're set. Why don't we enforce them? Mm-hmm. 
as far as our Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid and stuff, I mean, people paid into it for years and years. And if our government would have been good stewards with that money, we wouldn't be in the problem we're having. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, listen, I appreciate the call, Clifford. I yeah. want to wedge one more call in, but you're exactly right. Uh, they spent all that money, and they gave us a bunch of IOUs. The money's not there. This so-called trust fund, there's no trust fund. It's just a bunch of IOUs. All right, last call of the day. Let's grab a call from Deborah Grand Rapids, Michigan. Deborah, I got about 25 seconds. Hit me with your best shot. Oh, no, 25 seconds. Okay, hey, Brian, I was thrilled that you had Senator Colbeck on your show today. I've been, I'm from Michigan, been involved in politics here in the state for about 25 years now, and he is the real deal. He's taking on the establishment in Lansing, and I just want to tell my Michigan friends that he's taken on uh, the Democrat uh, side. That the L, um, We have a gubernatorial guy that's running there. His name is Abdul El uh, Saeed, and he's taken him on because he has ties with the Muslim Brotherhood, and he's the only Republican that's done that. He's got a lot of courage, and he's a humble, sweet man. So thank you so much for playing. Good for him. See you tomorrow. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio. Faith. Family. Freedom. American Family Radio. You can be among the first to receive updates about changes and special events coming up in our programming and always keep up with the things you might have missed with American Family Radio's weekly newsletter. Every Friday, you'll receive an email with a recap of the week's highlights from your favorite broadcasts, as well as important information about special programs in the near future. Add yourself to our mailing.